All right, uh, Chem 20, as we finished on Thursday, actually, with this bit here, um, talking about, you know, trends that we would expect to see between London forces and dipole-dipole forces, um, and how hydrogen fluoride beats up on all of those trends because it has hydrogen bonding. Um, and so instead of having a really low boiling point, it has a very high boiling point compared to the other ones here. All right, so we're going to finish up a couple more things with lesson four. Then we're going to get the video done for lesson five. Um, you'll have a couple of assignment-y kinds of things to work on, which you probably won't have enough time to finish today. Um, but you will have some time after tomorrow's quiz. So here we go. Um, physical properties of liquids. You should be aware of these names of these properties at least, right? Surface tension, meniscus, volatility. That might be a new one as well as capillary action. Um, volatility has to do with why things evaporate very quickly below their boiling point, or at least some things do. Um, so the first question is, why do some liquids, like water, exhibit surface tension? Um, if you've ever tried filling a cup up to the brim and then dropwise adding water, you'll notice you can make it kind of bubble up over the top, and that's because of surface tension. And basically, because water is, number one, polar, and number two, exhibits hydrogen bonding, there are strong... Um, intermolecular forces between the water molecules at the surface um, and they want to grab onto each other much stronger stronger than they want to grab onto the air so we have strong intermolecular molecular forces um, think mainly dipole dipole <clears throat> um, and then especially um, I'm going to put it in caps, I'm not yelling, but uh, hydrogen bonding because it's just the, the bigger of those two. And that holds those, um, holds the molecules of the liquid together. All right, a couple de mainly definitions on this page then. We've got uh, cohesion, which is, attract is attraction between like molecules. And then attraction between unlike molecules is known as adhesion. Um, adhesion will explain the meniscus of a liquid much more on that when we start making solutions. Um, but if I've got a um, you know, flask, something like this, I'm going to exaggerate it. Water is going to look something like that if I fill this up with water. All right. Um, we can also explain the volatility or how fast the water evaporates, or sorry, the liquid evaporates, and because that also depends on intermolecular forces. Um, substances with high volatility evaporate quickly because their intermolecular attractions are not very strong. So, for example, gasoline, um, if you've ever spilled a little bit of that, you smell it right away, and that's because it is very volatile. It evaporates quickly. Um, and the big thing there is there are not no strong intermolecular forces between the learn how to spell one day molecules. All right, so pause if you need to. I'm moving on. Um, in summary. Substances that have high surface tension, a good meniscus, exhibit capillary action, um, and low volatility are made from polar molecules. All right. Things that have low surface tension, no meniscus, do not exhibit capillary action, um, and have high volatility are made from, you maybe guessed it, um, nonpolar molecules. All right. So that was what we had left over from... Um, Thursday. Now, there's going to be an assignment if you look in your notes booklet on that. We're going to get to that later. So we're skipping that. Now you should grab your lesson five notes booklet. This one's, I think, shorter. All right. So, excuse my nose. I apologize. 
So we got to look here at some ionic compounds. Um, basically, ionic compounds is a metal plus a non-metal generally. Um, and if we start looking at what are some examples, sodium, whoops, sodium chloride, um, potassium nitrate. And there is not an easy, oh. Um, would be a couple examples there, right? We could add a couple more if we wanted, um, but that's really the gist of it here. Um, an ionic compound is a metal plus a non-metal. Um, if we have <clears throat> a bunch of metals, um, the name is that this is a metallic compound. Um, and generally when we talk about this, this would be like, Solid, oops, is it down? Gold, solid gold, or solid silver, or solid iron, or um, solid tungsten, etc. Um, these examples here, I2, H2O, CO2, um, looking at those, those are all, oops, um, sorry, non metal plus a non metal. And we would consider those things molecular compounds. All right, and then we've got this new one here that you maybe have seen before, but probably haven't. Um, and covalent network, um, these are going to be generally carbon with carbon or uh, carbon, I'm running out of space here. I'll just go underneath, carbon with silicon, all right. Um, and this is not every kind of carbon-carbon bond, so graphite is not a covalent network, but diamond is. Um, another one is silicon carbide, which sounds like it should be some kind of a molecular, but it is actually a covalent network, and we'll talk about those in a minute here. All right, so ionic crystals. Um, some of this is bringing together stuff we've already talked about. So ionic crystals are very stable. They are solid at SATP, um, standard ambient temperature and pressure. That um, works out too, and we'll talk mo much more about this with gases, but 25 degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals, almost one atmosphere. Um, they have very high melting and boiling points. They're very hard, but also very brittle. They do not conduct electricity unless we dissolve them or melt them. Um, how do ionic compounds form? Well, um, scientists explain the formation of ionic compound as involving collisions between metal and non-metal atoms that result in the transfer of electrons. So we're not sharing, we are transferring. This is going to form cations and anions, and these cations and anions will have filled valence energy levels. Um, According to the theory, why does this transfer take place? And this is electronegativity, because of large differences in electronegativity between metal and non-metal atoms. Pause as you need here. I'm going to keep going. All right, so a model for ionic compounds. Um, we're going to talk about a crystal lattice, and this is going to be a continuous three-dimensional pattern of atoms, ions, or molecules in a crystalline solid. Um, according to laboratory evidence and the ion model, ion attractions are non-directional. Um, what does this mean? Well, it means that all positive ions attract all nearby negative ions. The result is that there is no distinct neutral molecules in ionic compounds. So if you imagine each one of you as some kind of an ion, um, you could imagine somebody sitting to your left and to your right, in front of you, behind you, above you, below you. Um, and if you were a positive ion, you would be pulling in negative ions to all those kind of six locations is often the way it would work. Um, you can get into lots of really complicated ge geometry stuff with this, but that's generally what we're looking at. All right, so no distinct mo neutral molecules in ionic compounds. That's the big thing here. 
um, ionic compounds have chemical formulas that show only a formula unit or empirical formula expressing the simplest whole number ratio of ions. Um, in regarding chemical formulas of ionic compounds, it is very important to remember two things. Number one, um, ionic compound formulas do not represent molecules. All right, so when I say NaCl, I'm talking about sodium chloride or table salt. In that thing, there is not a whole bunch of one sodium and one chloride units all um, bound together. Right? Each sodium is attracted to a whole bunch of different chlorides. Ion charges are never shown, so they must be referenced or memorized. So you're going to have to look in your periodic table. Um, you're going to have to use the Roman numeral system um, if there's more than one, and so on. But we don't show, oh, that this is Na plus Cl minus or something like that. So you would have to reference them or, I guess, memorize them depending on what they are. Um, metallic crystals. So metals are shiny, they are flexible, and they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Um, what property of tungsten makes it a good filament for light bulbs? It's high melting point is the big one here. Tungsten melts at a crazy high temperature. Um, and so we can use it as the filament in light bulbs, um, which allows that to glow very brightly when it gets really, really hot, um, giving off white light, allowing us to see. Um, but it is high melting point here. Um, metallic bonding, this is slightly a step beyond what we absolutely need, but it's a question lots of students have in Chem 20, so I'll take a moment here to um, help you out with this. So with metallic bonding, the electrons are not held strongly to their atoms, and so they can easily become mobile. So <coughs> in your textbook, and pause if you need to to get that, um, page 32, there's a little picture. Um, draw a small version of that you don't have to draw all of them uh, and explain the what what the electrons are believed to do in metallic bonding all right so pause and do that and then let's move on <coughs> excuse me um, so how does this model of metallic bonding explain the following properties all right so in terms of the shininess um, and why they're ref some of them anyways are reflective the mobile electrons um, actually work really well to reflect the light. Um, flexibility. Um, there are strong but not, sorry, non, let's go with rigid bonds between the atoms. Whoops. And electrical conductivity. Mobile atoms are easily moved by an electric current. Um, and then finally, our crystalline structure. Um, this allows for maximum space between the positive nuclei and, uh, oops, I learned how to spell and allows the electrons room to move. Let's make that on a new line. Lovely. So again, pause as need be. Molecular crystals. Um, so molecular solids are generally soft. They're non-conductors of heat and electricity and have relatively low melting and boiling points. <laughs> Excuse me. In general, molecules are packed together as close together as their size and shape allow. What holds what forces holds those molecules together would be intermolecular forces. So this would be our London forces, our dipole dipole forces, and our hydrogen bonding. Why can't dissolved molecular crystals conduct electricity? 
because the individual entities here are neutral molecules. All right. Um, covalent network solids are covalent network crystals are extremely hard. They are the hardest things on earth. And they, they're also somewhat brittle. Um, they have extremely high melting and boiling points. They're insoluble and they are non conductors of both heat and electricity. So why is diamond sometimes used to make drill bits and to coat the tips of saw blades? Because it is so hard and it takes a long time to wear down. Um, a covalent network is a 3D arrangement of atoms continuously linked throughout the crystal by strong covalent bonds. So imagine your carbon, which normally as a central atom would form a tetrahedral structure, is just hooked to a whole bunch of other carbons. And you're kind of imagining a diamond at that point. All right. All right, coming back to our um, molecular crystals. Um, melting and then also boiling points of molecular compounds are totally dependent on intermolecular forces. So if we can imagine, for example, bromine and iodine monochloride, they both have 70 electrons. But why is there such a difference here? Well, the big difference is what kind of forces are there in between them? Bromine is nonpolar. There's London forces. That's about it. Um, iodine monochloride, same thing, London forces. But um, we have dipole-dipole forces here in the iodine monochloride. And those dipole-dipole forces um, increase our boiling point from 59 to almost 100. Um, and if we take a look here, the, a little bit of just about shape of molecules. Um, so in both of these molecules, um, we're looking at C5H12. One of them we would just normally call pentane, or the old way of calling it would be n-pentane. Um, and then we've also got another one which we used to call neopentane, and I'm really happy we don't have to learn that naming system anymore. Um, what used to be known as neopentane, we would now call this 2,2-dimethylpropane. All right, so... Um, I suppose neopentane is a smaller word, but it's definitely um, harder to... It's one more set of things, structures to memorize. Um, one other common one, and this is like if you've ever been to a doctor and they're going to take a blood sample or they're going to clean your skin so that they can give you a needle or something like that, um, they're going to rub something that will feel cold on your skin, and that's generally rubbing alcohol or often known as isopropyl alcohol. Um, and this isopropyl alcohol actually is, um, we would call this methyl uh, propanol. It's got a one methyl group coming off the middle carbon. Um, so when we look at that, anyways, there's other ones like that. So we've got neopentane, we've got iso, we could have actually isopentane, which would be just, um, I believe... Um, isopentane would be putting another one of these. Hmm. I'd have to look that up actually now that I think about it. You could look that up if you'd like. Anyways, <laughs> both types of molecules here have five carbon atoms and 12 hydrogens, but their shapes are quite different. You can see this kind of as a long bubble. Um, this is more of a spherical bubble. Um, London... Dispersion forces are greater between linear molecules than between spherical molecules, and that is what we use to explain the difference in boiling points. All right, so your first job, page 80, questions 1 to 6 and 10. Um, with question 10, you are welcome to do that graph by hand, but I would recommend that you did that in Google Sheets. Um, and if you're having trouble figuring that out, you could Google how to do it, or when I'm back, I can help you. But get the, the data in there, so it's a, it's a quick and easy thing to do. 
Um, and then in your workbook, you have an intramolecular forces assignment that needs to be done. If for some reason you finish that all, which I don't know, you might, um, you also have a bonding research assignment that we can hand out to you. All right. Other than that, have a great day. And we'll see you when I get back.